that's about the worst I've done in one of those. All right. Such is life. Huh? Okay, now. Great to be doing this again. I don't remember what number we're on. Like something like 178 or something like that. And I'm going to remind you we don't do the ads during the video, during the live stream. We'll do, I'll set it to ads afterwards. Uh, that's for the people who are going to be here live. That's about all the benefit <laughs> that you get from um, being here at the same time as while I'm here. Um, what else? Let's jump into the questions. I have two questions already to start. Uh, the first one might be a little bit We'll use this as a jumping off point. When I got a comment and the guy says something along the lines, I like your sound. Um, how do you do that? How do you get that kind of sound? And I was going to post my, how do you get a good sound video? And so I did a search on my site because, you know, I've got thousands of videos. Um, not quite thousands, I think. Uh, 1400 or something like that 1400 videos so i'm doing a search and it turns out i haven't done a video on how to get a good sound so we'll talk a little bit about it right now and then later i'll try to remember to put a, a video together dedicated in more depth on how to get a good sound i'm going to say First, and you guys probably already know what I'm going to say first. If you've been watching my videos at all, you'll know that the first thing is you have to be doing the listening. Listening to great players. I had a, a, a half lesson yesterday. I say a half lesson because our power went out. But before, when we got started with this student, um, he told me, I started doing the listening, he says, and I went to your website, and I, he says, I spent time listening to Maurice Andre, and then I spent time listening to Alison Balsam. And I'm like, that's the best news I could have got all week, <laughs> that a student is doing the listening, because it's impossible to get a great sound if you've never heard what a great sound sounds like. So that's the first thing, listening. And we should listen to recordings, we should listen to videos, but more importantly is if you can find some great trumpet players to listen to live, you should do that. Some people that's not an option. For some people you might live in a town that doesn't have any great trumpet players and so that's why we have to have the recordings and the videos. That's, a, you know, uh, that said, every time you have a chance, if you live in a small town, every time you have a chance to go to a master class or a, you know, I remember my first teacher in El Paso. I had three, three different teachers in El Paso. My first teacher in El Paso took me to New Mexico for a master class do that kind of thing because that that helps also with the listening is we're not just listening to the music if we can hear what they're saying about the music that's important too okay so let's say that if you want a great sound you have to hear a great sound uh there's no way to get a great sound without hearing it first and you have to hear it done first before you can hear yourself doing it the second thing I'm going to say is that you should be doing a routine based on the physical trumpet pyramid. The physical trumpet pyramid is the order of the exercises. And I'm going to give you an outline of that pyramid right now. You do an air exercise. You follow that up with lip buzz exercise. You follow that up with a mouthpiece placement exercise. And then mouthpiece exercise, mouthpiece buzzing, and then long tones, and then uh, 
tonalization studies, if you don't have tonalization studies, you can put the uh, some flow studies in at that point. Then you do some lip slurs or interval studies, and then you do articulation. This is also where you would do, after lip slurs is also where you would do pedal tones. Um, after pedal tones, articulation. After articulation, articulated intervals. And then after the intervals, you should do the double tongue and triple tongue. And then I like to, I don't always do this, but I like to end my routine with some sort of lyrical study. Conconi, there, I have a bunch of uh, lyrical books. It doesn't have to be that. Sometimes I just improvise a lyrical melody. So I like to do that. Can't always do that because of time constraints, but I like to do that. Um, so yes, the second thing on the list is to do your routine in that order. Doing, so a lot of people, the reason I teach the, the physical trumpet pyramid order is because not everybody's going to use my routine books. The easiest way to do that order would be to do the routines from my books because it's all laid out for you. And that includes the daily routine book, the trumpet, the Chops Express book, and then there are a series of uh, trumpet chops book. So there's trumpet chops Tyro, trumpet chops, trumpet chops player, trumpet chops apprentice, trumpet chops pro, trumpet chops master. Lately, I've been working on the trumpet chops pioneer book. Um, I do that during my practice time, so I'm kind of sacrificing my practice time to get that book done. Um, I've been doing it like that since I started writing the chops books. Um, so I, every morning I wake up and I do the, the trumpet, the new pioneer routine. Anyway, so those, those books have the, the trumpet pyramid built into them. So you don't have to think your way through it. You just do the exercise, you're done. If you don't want to use my books for that, you can actually do whatever exercises you've always been doing, but rearrange the order so that they fit that pyramid structure. So that's the second thing. Uh, you would you would think that that doesn't help your, your sound. It absolutely helps your sound. When you've done it for about two or three months, you're going to notice a huge change in your sound. And a lot of other things too, for that matter. That's why we do it in that order. I've heard people say, oh, it doesn't matter. Find what works for you and, and do the exercises in that order. The order doesn't matter. I've heard people say that. Um, and in a sense, they're right. Maybe you'll stumble, stumble onto something in your haphazard approach to putting whatever you want in whatever order. Maybe you'll stumble upon something that might work for you. I'm not going to say that's not a possibility. But if you do the physical trumpet pyramid order, you will get certain benefits from that. And one of those benefits is that you're going to get a better sound. Now, I should have put this second instead of ending up third only because I forgot. I'm trying to put these in order of importance. And yes, the most important thing you should do most important, I'm going to stress that one more time. Most important thing you should do is listen to great trumpet players. Second most important thing, we're kind of backtracking here. Second most important thing is the three levels of rest. If you haven't watched that video, please do watch that video. Type Eddie Lewis, three, three levels of rest. If you're not doing the three levels of rest, you're not getting the best sound that you could get. Not resting will cause you to have an inferior sound. It's just a fact of life. If you don't rest, you will get an inferior sound. 
Okay, those are the three most important things. Let's put them in the correct order. Listening, getting proper rest. And the three levels of rest, just to, to abbreviate real quick, is the beat level, the hour slash minute level, and the day level. All right. I won't go into more detail because we have a video about that. Then the third thing, the third most important thing is the physical trumpet pyramid order for the exercises that you do in your in your um, routine. I will add as a fourth that you should be practicing music. If you are only practicing exercises, now, the reason I'm listing these in the order, as in most important, because the stuff at the top is most beneficial. The most beneficial thing you can do to change your sound, to get a better sound, is listening. The most beneficial thing you can do to get a great sound, uh, second, most, second most beneficial thing, is going to be making sure you're resting at the right time for the right amount of time. The third thing is going to be not now. What am I saying? I'm saying that this physical trumpet pyramid is going to help. It's just not going to help as much as those other two things. I hope that makes sense. Then the next thing is number four is make sure you're practicing music. If you're only practicing exercises, there are certain automatic mechanisms, for lack of a better word, certain automatic mechanisms that don't fire the way they're supposed to fire if you're not playing music on a regular basis. Now, there have been people who argue that they play so much music, like they're, they're professionally speaking, that all they have time for in their warm-up is to do exercises. And I'm almost okay with that. Not really. Almost okay. I think if all you, if you're so busy that you you have no time to practice music, then you should be replacing your exercises with music that gives you the same technical qualities. That's my opinion. Anyway, so if you want uh to get a better sound those are the four things i would recommend to start with now there is because the when people leave these comments what are they leaving them on they're leaving on videos that have my recordings and there is a lot to be said about mic placement improper mic placement can give you a terrible terrible sound for that matter, having having a, like if you're trying to record yourself on a USB mic without an interface, without any actual software for doing real recording, mostly the interface. I think the interface is the most important thing. Having a real, uh, a, a real MIDI interface, not MIDI, uh, digital interface, that's going to be, a huge benefit but yes how far away the mic is whether the mic should be up whether it should be down whether it should be pointed straight at the mic or off to the side all of these things change what the sound is going to be like and a lot of times I have to wonder because people say oh you have such a lovely sound I'm like I think you're talking about my mic placement I don't have a very fancy mic. I don't have very fancy recording equipment. I don't do fancy EQ. Um, my EQ on my recordings is flat. In other words, there's no EQ. Whatever the mic picked up, that's what it is. I don't tamper with that. The only thing I do tamper with sometimes, hasn't been lately, sometimes I'll tamper with an EQ on the reverb itself sometimes 
And the only reason I do that is because sometimes the reverbs that are automatic are so shrill, it hurts my ears. <laughs> and that's funny, right? Because I'm, I'm legally deaf. And if I'm legally deaf and that hurts my ears, I can just imagine how much torture it is to people that can hear. Um, so, but yes, when, when I, with, without any special treatment to the sound, I'll put the mic out there and find what makes this room sound best. All right. I'm always between three to six feet away from the, the bell. It's not like what you see in the, in the recording studio. Now that's how I do it in the recording studio because that's how they're trained to, to, to do it. They probably don't know how to record the way I do in the studio. I experimented until I found what worked for me. That probably doesn't work in the studio um, for whatever reason. So for in the studio, they want you like right here. Here's the bell and there's the mic. They want that. And then whatever change they have to make in the EQ, they'll do that digitally. Not a big fan of that. But, you know, they, they, they have kind of like formulas that they have to follow to get a certain sound in the overall package. And usually when I'm in the studio, it's not as a soloist. I'm playing in a horn section or in a big band or whatever. It's not me being featured, so it's not like... Um, anyway, so the point is, the sound that you get, when people say, oh, you sound so lovely, part of that, I'm not going to say I don't sound good. I, I probably do sound halfway decent. <laughs> but um, part of that is really where I put the microphone. You'd be surprised at how much difference that makes. Let me read Gabriel. Hello, Gabriel. Let me read your question real quick. Gabriel says, hello, Eddie and friends. You told me to warm up with the B flat and study with the C. Was I? Was it right? Yeah, that, I said that's what other people do. I, well, and, and when I say that, I mean that's what people did when I was studying orchestra stuff 30 years ago. <laughs> okay. And what do you mean to warm up? with B flat, making all the routine with it, and uh, and then go to the C. Yes, that's basically what I mean. And yes, I, I'm not saying, see, I don't tell people that. I don't tell people that they have to do that. Okay? That's, that's how I did it in the past, and um, that's how I was taught is that the guys will work, work warm up and and, and the, the the thinking was back then that if you warmed up on the C your sound would be a little bit more shrill than if you warmed up on the B flat let me be more clear about that if and and this who knows how true any of this stuff is this is what i was taught and I just never questioned it. Uh, the, you know, so the, the thinking is, if you warm up on the B flat, your sound on the C will be warmer. As opposed to if you warm up on the C, your sound on the C later is going to be less warm and more shrill. At least that was my understanding of what they were teaching us. I hope that makes sense. You know, I'm so tempted right now to buy that C trumpet that I've been telling you guys about. I have pictures somewhere of those trumpets. Um, I would almost want to go to their shop and, and try different horns. They probably don't have that as an option, right? It's all custom instruments. But, yeah, I'm very tempted. It, the, what, what? So even though right now I might have the money for it, there's still that other side of the issue. If I don't have gigs that I can play it on, 
what's the point, right? So, yeah, I'm, I would, I'm tempted, and that's about as far as that's going to go, I think, <laughs> right? Um, anyway, let's go to the other other question. We've talked about this before, um, but it came up in a different context. This is from Sean. Sean says, I was reading a post on, and I won't mention the website, um, I was reading a post about a bright red ring on tr a trumpet player's upper lip from mouthpiece pressure, and one of the moderators said he didn't know any professional trumpet player that didn't have a ring uh, or mangled lips from 8 to 10 hours a day, 7 days a week with lips between the mouthpiece and the teeth, almost like a badge of honor. Then he asks, do you think that is a true statement that if you are a professional, that it's just common to have mangled lips in the ring? Well, let me say, just to be grammatically correct, I think it's probably true that this dude, whoever he is, says he doesn't know any professional trumpet player that doesn't have a ring. That's probably true. What does that mean? Probably doesn't mean anything. <laughs> and that's the point I want to get to. So let's answer your question specifically. Is it common for professional trumpet players to have mangled lips and a ring? And I went through and made a list, if I can find it. It's looking for people that are famous pros that from the picture, I have to be clear about this. I'm talking about their online, online photos. And I went through a bunch of photos, right? And I have to wonder, now that I've done this, if they don't, Photoshop some of this stuff out. You know, when you look up for someone famous, what you get is promo, sh you know, it's almost like glamour shots. And whether it be Photoshopped or, so like there's a, there's a, a, a lot of photography where the, the people are at, any, at an angle. And you have to wonder if the photographer is not thinking, boy, that 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 his lip is so ugly. Let's see if we can find it. And they will have him like smile like this, right? That stretches that mangled part out. Um, so I have to wonder if there isn't some of that going on. Because for example, I found Chris Body. I have a big question a question mark against his name. I found Chris Body where he's got nothing here at all. But then I've seen other photos of him where it's like more live. And there's a little bit of something. And, you know, now that I'm looking at my lips, I have like a little bit of, of you can see a little bit of different shape there, right? But it's barely visible. Barely visible. In fact, I like to tell people that the, that the indent that I have here and the indent that I have here were actually from the days in the 80s when I did so much damage to my lips that I don't think that'll ever... When I rub my finger across here, there's tissue missing here. I don't think that's ever going to fill back in. I think this tissue is gone. I think that tissue there is gone from the way I used to play. This side is not as bad, but, but it's, I got the same thing here. This is where the mouthpiece goes in. So, um, there are some other players, and for example, Mike Sachs is an orchestra trumpet player. I don't see anything on his lips. Now, maybe if there, uh, if there was a more close-up, maybe you could see something like what you would see with me. I don't, like, when, when I read your description, 
I wouldn't call this mangled. Not compared to how it used to be. I'll tell you what, if you ever saw a photo from me in the early 80s, you would see that this was always purple. I had a permanent bruise on my lip. I thought that's just the color my lip was. I didn't think it had anything to do with playing trumpet. But when I started playing the physical trumpet pyramid, it went away. I also used to have calluses on my big knots of calluses on my top lip. I used to have that. That went away. When I changed to the physical trumpet pyramid, all of that went away. So what you see now is just like the residual stuff that won't go away. Okay. So Mike Sachs, as far as I can tell, doesn't have it. Tim Hagens doesn't look so much. Sergei Nikariakov. These guys, and I, I wasn't able to like fully go through every photo I could find. Um... But these are guys that don't have, quote-unquote, mangled lips. They don't have a red ring. Now, the red ring, we, we've talked about this before. If you're playing, and let's say you play for an hour, and then you put your horn down, and there's a red ring. That's not the same thing as what we're talking about. Everybody gets that. It's the permanent stuff. Now, the, the one that I find most interesting and like i said i'm going to say it one more time because this is important i'm going by the photos that I, that I can find on the internet these might not be 100 percent accurate so the one that interests me the most is scott engelbright and and the reason why is if Scott Engelbright is still practicing what he used to say in the 90s, I think it was the 90s, it might have been more re recent than that. If, if he's still doing what he says he used to do, he used to rest every 15 minutes. Play for 15 minutes, rest for 15 minutes, play for 15 minutes, rest for 15 minutes. He's one of those high note guys, right? He can play loud, he can play high. Why is his lip not mangled? Because that's usually when we see that. You can say, oh, Mike Sachs, well, he's not a lead player. Um, Tim Hagens, he's not really a lead player. Um, Sergei Nikaryakov, you can say, oh, well, that's a classical guy. He's, you know, that doesn't count, you might think. But look at uh, Scott Engelbright. He doesn't have mangled lips, but he's doing a harder... But the way he plays, now I don't know what kind of stuff he does like for a living, um, but he's quite capable. You would think that if someone's that capable and he's like as widely known as that guy is, that he's playing some hard stuff and he's not mangled, not, according to the photo that I found. That's the other thing. Most people, when they... Um, take photos as trumpet players, they, they, they're put, they've got the horn up. That doesn't help. We don't know what it looks like. So, so that's my first point is obviously there are pros that don't have mangled lips. Obviously there is such a thing. Let's get to the most important point about all of this is that none of this matters. When you have a statement like, and this is secondhand, so I'm not, I'm not quoting the person he's quoting, I'm quoting Sean here. Um, when someone says, I don't know any professional trumpet player that didn't have a ring. There's a sort of superstitious thing that kicks in and people say, well, I need to work to try to get that ring. You, you even used almost like a badge of honor. You, you have that on, on the question, almost like a badge of honor. And so that's where this breaks down. 
Do you have a mark? Do you not have a mark? What does that matter? It doesn't matter. But if you're trying to get a mark because you don't have one, that's backwards thinking. That's the, the cart before the horse. Remember, all physical work should be done for musical reasons. If you are trying to get a badge of honor, you're not doing it for, phys for musical reasons. That's not musical. That's not musical. Okay? So that's the most important point I want to make on this issue. If you're trying to get a mark on here, if you're trying to get uh, calluses on your lips so that people can say, oh, he must really be a great trumpet player. Um, that's just another example of people doing something other than getting better on their horn. That's just another example of people putting their effort in the wrong place. Hello, Karen. Karen says, hi, Eddie. You said you would probably get more gigs for your sea trumpet if you had one. <laughs> you, yeah, you know, that's true. So the need for it might grow. You're right. You're right. I did say that, and it is, probably is true. Yeah. Are you guys trying to convince me to get a sea trumpet? All right. Sean says, thanks for the discussion this, discussing this, Eddie. I sent a text with Chris Body's bright red ring. Oh, let me double check that. I didn't know that was Chris Body. Wow. Well, we can take him off of the list then. You know, he plays off to the side worse than I do. You see that? I didn't know it was Chris Body. Look how far off to the side his his ring is. We'll have to put him on the list of players that, that play off to the side. Gabriel says, the rotary C trumpet sound is very warm, so, it, so it's not very different from the B flat. I don't know about the pistons. Okay, you, you know what? Also, the design makes a huge difference, too. So when I was taught to do the B flat first, it was because we were all playing, no, not because, I shouldn't have said that. When I was taught to do the B-flat first, everybody was playing Bach everything. And I'm sure that plays into it. And having said that, you know, when we do, when I talk about that, that Blackburn C trumpet, when I talk about that, it's because... It doesn't play like a boxy trumpet. It doesn't sound like a boxy trumpet. It sounds to me like a trumpet. It's a beautiful, beautiful horn. It's it's as beautiful sounding as my other horns. And that's why I sold my other C, is that other C was not in league with the horns I've got right now as in, in terms of how they sound. My other C was nowhere close. It was like playing on a beginner instrument. So, anyway, let me close this real quick. It's distracting me. Um, yeah. What else? So, let me tell you guys, today we finally... Um, Got the physical books in for the Christmas duet book. And um, I might end up ordering some more of those. And I started this week 
really getting busy on the new duet book. <laughs> Our sixth duet book. I think it's a sixth. Let's see. The Celebration, the Tyro, the Pioneer, the... Yes, this will be the sixth one because there's the trumpet hymn duets, the Christmas duets. Now it'll be the trumpet player duets. That'll be six duet books. woo Before I turn 60. It'll be like, by the time I turn 60, I'll have a book for every year of my life. By the time we get there, huh? Close to it, anyway. Um, Gabriel says, "Any anyway, I found the C a bit harder than the B flat. Harder to warm up on, is that what you're saying? Harder to get a good sound or harder to play? Any other questions? I see we've got people here. Harder to play and go up in the register. Oh, I see. There was a time when I wanted a, a, a rotary trumpet because I was still thinking about being an orchestra guy. And then also, um, there's a trumpet player from Brazil that plays on a rotary trumpet, a, a jazz guy. Claudio Roditi. Let me let me spell his name here. One of my favorite trumpet players. I don't have enough recordings of his stuff. I think this is the right spelling. Claudio. Claudio Roditi. Let me look if that's the right spelling. Yes, that's the right spelling. Yes, Gabriel says, I know people playing jazz on the rotary. Uh, what a wonderful. You know, I heard him live. I might be getting two things mixed up. My memory, you know, um, can sometimes, and, and people say, oh, I must be getting old. That's not what this is. I've been doing this my whole life. <laughs> If I learn two songs at the same time, I know better than that. If I learn two songs at the same time, I will never get the titles right. I will always think this is the other title or that's the other title. The two songs always get mixed up in my head because I learned them both at the same time. Um, but here's how I remember it. I heard Claudio Roditi live at a jazz, like think I... IAJE, the International Association of, of Jazz Educators. Um, his band was there. Wonderful performance. And I heard him play a blues over a samba. And man, that was great. I like his playing. And he was playing, you know, I would have never known if it wasn't that for that live performance that he's playing on a on a rotary trumpet. Yeah, I love his playing. I, I wish I had, you know, now that we have YouTube, I should probably just um, type his name and see how much stuff comes up. In fact, let's do that now. So It's amazing sometimes when you type someone's name. And you see that there's nothing with them on the, on YouTube at all. It's amazing sometimes. You would think, hey, this guy's famous, and there's no videos. But that's not this guy. This There's a bunch of videos of, of his playing. Um, now, there's some videos of him playing a regular piston trumpet. But yeah, most of what I'm seeing here is, oh, and this is an album that I've got, um, Red on Red, I think is the name of it, Red on Red, that's a great album. Let 
Yeah. So it looks like they have a bunch of his albums on YouTube. So you and live performances too. So that's something worth checking out. You know, people ask me who's my favorite. I don't like that word because there's so many great players that I like to listen to. And you know what's funny about that? I just read an article. You know, there's so much hatred in this world. So much hatred. And I'll read an article about like an interview or something with some trumpet player that I like to listen to. And I find out that this trumpet player hates everybody that falls in the category I'm in. He hates them, right? And I, I just read an article yesterday about this trumpet player that I have been enjoying. And he's going on about how much he hates people like me. Hate, I mean, like, like frothing mad hatred, right? And I don't care. I'm going to listen to their music. The only time I'll stop listening to someone's music is if, actually, you know what? What, the, what, what I used to say is that if their message is hate, hateful. And so that's what I used to say. But now, now, so that's still true. If if there's a hateful message, I won't listen to the music. But now there's other things, too, that I will stop listening. But if someone hates me, I'm not going to stop listening to the music. Just because someone hates me, that's not going to happen. You know, and, and one of the reasons why is because I happen to know that a lot of times they mouth off like that is because it's part of the industry. It's part of the industry. So if you were to meet that person face to face, they probably wouldn't hate you. That kind of thing. It's part of what they have to do to make a living. That's a shame. Um, anyway. Sean says, do you think it's okay to use Chops Express during the week and then use the Chops books when I have time? Can you get the same benefits just using the Express books? Um, that's why I wrote those books. It wasn't to be a long-term thing for people that didn't have time to practice. They ended up becoming that. It ended up being um, something that... People say, well, I don't need any other book because I'm not going to practice more than 30 minutes a day anyway. So, yes, um, that's what the original intention was, that on the days you didn't have an hour to practice, you would practice the, the, the Chopped Express book. So it's exactly what you just described. That was the intention. Now, do you get the same benefits? Uh, you get some of the same benefits, not all of the same benefits, because there's a reason why the routines as long as they are. There's a reason why some of those routines last longer than an hour. And if you're only doing 15 minutes, you're not going to get those benefits. But the benefits that we were talking about earlier in the video, where we're saying... You know, to get a better sound, do the exercises in this order. You're getting those benefits. Okay. All right. What else? Any other questions? I play with my beard, right? And then I remember reading an article 
and I forget what this is called when people like they they rub their arm or whatever. I forget what it's called, but it's supposed to be signs of a mental illness. <laughs> Or not, maybe not a, a mental illness, but a uh, a mental, what do they call that? Like a personality disorder or something like that. Self-grooming, I think they call it self-grooming or something. But what's happening now, I don't do this all day. I'm looking at myself in the, in the playback and I see this like big fuzz thing sticking out and I'm trying to make it to go back down. Anyway, other other questions. Who's got questions? You know, technically, when I started the, these Q and A's, oh. Gabriel asks. When you get the C, will you use the same mouthpiece? Well, since I have a kit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Gabriel says, we know you You will get the, the C trumpet. <laughs> oh, man. I, I just can't. I, it's hard for me to justify that kind of an expense. Anyway, so what I was going to say is um, with the... With the kit that I have, I don't have to play the same mouthpiece. I have a whole kit here. I can spend time figuring out what works great for that horn. So mm. I might spend time. Uh, I don't know what would be different. Maybe the back bar would be different. Maybe a different cup depth or something. I don't know. But is there a chance that I would play the same mouthpiece? There's a chance it would just be the same mouthpiece. So what I was saying earlier was when I first put this Q, uh, Q&A together, the original intent was to talk about, uh, to answer questions that people had about the books. And I didn't mind talking about other things as well since we're already here, right? Um, but there are pe things people keep asking about the books. Mm -hmm. uh, like that question that Sean just asked. Is it okay to do Chops Express during the week and the other books on the weekend? Yes, absolutely, it's okay. Gabriel says, it's shorter than the B-flat, right? Yes, that's correct. And it's a very specific m amount of shortness. And, by the way, um, the other slides are supposed to be shorter as well. You just won't notice as much. But if you take a C trumpet slide and compare it to, I'm talking about like the the valve slides, right? So like this will be a little different, a little shorter. This will be a little shorter. This will be a little shorter. So otherwise, if you didn't do that, it wouldn't be in tune. Karen says, is it safe to leave a trumpet in a hot car temporarily? Yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I've accidentally left in the hot car for over a week sometimes. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. What you would have to do afterwards is clean it. Because all the stuff that's inside will cook. And now you've got almost solid stuff cooked onto your trumpet. James says, hello, James. Does your mustache ever get between the mouthpiece and lip and interfere with your seal? Yes, sir, it does. <laughs> um, I'm not one to do a lot of setting. You know what setting is, right? Setting is those guys, right? They have to do like, five seconds of moving things around until they get the mouthpiece to sit on the hook. But I have to do a little bit of setting to get on, out of the way of the, the mustache. 
what I do is I slide it over underneath like that. I'm over exaggerating right right now. Um, gone are the days when I just come up. Okay, that actually worked that time. But yes, I've had time when, when I put the horn up and there'd be a few uh, whiskers caught in there and I, I, I can't play like that. What's funny is I know trumpet players that do play over the mustache like that. And more, even more trombone players. There's trombone players that put it up there and they don't have really that much problem with it. Not a lot. I'm not saying there's a lot of them, but there's there are people that do that. Gabriel says, what about your book on reading music better? <laughs> you were going to write it. Um, that, you know, I have a, a list. And the joke is, every time I finish a new book, there's three or four new book ideas that I have that get put on the list. And if I open it up now, there's probably 20 books. I'm not exaggerating. There's probably 20 books on my list that I want to write. Now, what I told you about is a sight reading book. That This one is just in the idea stage. I haven't put anything down yet. But the idea was, yeah, let's look at that. I'm on, I have this long list that's numbered. I'm on number 12. Number 12 is the trumpet player duets. Okay. There are one, if you include trumpet player, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. And then I have another whole page of ideas. And that's where the sight reading book is. So 24 books that are actually in the planning stage. And then one, two, three, four, five, six books that are in the idea stage. <laughs> oh, no. The deeper, the more you dig in, the deeper you go, huh? So what? The idea for that book is that the deeper you get into it, the more badly written it is. But no, I haven't done anything, not, nothing gone forward with that. You know what puts something on farther back on the list is if I don't think anyone's going to buy it. I, You know, I love doing stuff to do stuff. Um, if it's not something I can use with the students, if it's not something I can... So then, then it's just a waste of time. So I would like to. I don't know that I would ever. It's a, this falls in the same category as that C trumpet. You know, and, and here's the thing. I'm not. What's that word? I always get that mixed up with, with cosmopolitan. That's not the word I'm thinking of. Um, anyway, there's a. You have two basic philosophies of life, right? You have on the one side, you have the, the um, Stoics. And on the other side, you have the other people. I forget what they're called. Uh, hedonism is on that side. Um, and I, don't, I know that that's a false dichotomy when you look at all of the different philosophies. But you can pretty much uh, cut them down the middle. Um, like that. And I'm on the, the stoic side of that divide. And I don't just do stuff like because I feel like it. I have to have a, a, a rational, logical reason to do something like that. So if I say I would like to do something, I would like a sea trumpet, I would like... Um, 
I would like to write a book. I would like to write a composition. There's compositions in my head that I would like to write that um, unless someone says, hey, I want to give you um, $10,000 and I want you to write whatever it is that you want to write, then I have to know that the, whatever it is I'm writing should be able to sell. And I know that looks bad when people are, when people do tend to be the other way, they look at something like what I just said and they say, oh, you're such an evil person. You're only doing it for the money. That's not what I said. I'm not saying I will only do it because I want money. I'm saying that, so I look at money. Here's how I see money. Money is represents value. So when I say, if it's not going to pay, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> That's a visitor. <laughs> hey, Mipu. Oh, not Mipu. I don't know what I'm saying. Um, Misu. I call him Misu. <laughs> anyway, so what I'm saying is, there has to be value not just to me. Other people need to value it or I'm not going to do it. I don't need to just self-satisfy. Self-satisfy. Okay? If there's no value in it coming from other people, then I won't write it. Sean says, how long should the CHOPS books take to complete? I'm actually adding 22 tonalizations just to help me learn them. I think uh, 22. What do you mean 22? Where are you getting 22 from? It's it's 20, and you wouldn't be adding 20. You, you mean adding up to 20. I'm confused. So each of the each of the chops books takes a little longer. And some people, I don't understand it. Some people take amazingly long times to finish. Um, I've had students that for like the, the Trumpet Chops Pro book, I've had some students take over two and a half hours. I don't understand that. I don't understand how it could take two and a half hours um, unless you're putting a lot of time in between the exercises. I don't understand it. That's... And that was never my intention. The, the Trumpet Chops Pro, once you get it to where you can play it without, without stopping, the Trumpet Chops Pro should take right out an hour, maybe an hour and 10 minutes. Um, and yet I know people that are taking two and a half hours to get it done. I just don't understand that. I'm working with those students to figure out what to do about that. I just don't understand how that's happening. Now, it could be that they're repeating stuff because they got it wrong. That's clearly in the instructions not to do that. It could also be that they're resting too long between exercises. I, in the first book, which is the Trumpet Chops Pro book, I have at the end two practice tests. And one of those practice tests was my son. And I asked him to play it while I watched. And he took so such long, long, long breaks in between in between the exercises. And it made it it stretched it out for like an hour and a half. I wasn't expecting that. And then I, I worked with him afterwards. Uh, practice test, you don't inter, you don't interrupt the student. For a proper practice test, you let them go and you observe. And the idea was to have a practice test I could put in the back of the book. And what, what I put in the back of the book is his actual practice test. Yeah, it's 20. So, yes, some people take longer than it's supposed to take.
I think it's 10 minutes each time for each lower one. So 50 minutes for the apprentice, 40 minutes for the player, uh, 30 minutes for the Tyro. The master is not now the master is all messed up. I could not find a way to make it short enough. The master one takes me about an hour and a half to finish. Which is all, I actually ended up figuring, hey, you know what, they've got the other books if they want. Um, let's go ahead and keep it the way it is because it makes sense. Now, the master one just has more exercises. So when you say adding 20 to every routine, you mean over and above what's already there. So like if the routine has um, four of them already, like you say Ch Chops Express has four tonalization studies, um, you're, you're adding another 20 over the four? I don't, I don't understand that. Or are you taking all the way to the 20? So one common thing, and I'm, maybe this is what he's talking about. Um, if I do have to do the Chops Express, I will do all 20 of the tonalization studies. I don't just do Chops Express just by itself. I do the, the whole 20 tonalization studies. Karen says, shouldn't you just replace the express tonalization with the 20? That's what I'm saying. That's what, I, maybe that's what he means. That's, that's what I would do. James says, Chops Pro takes me about an hour and a half, but I do optional articulation and I and I have to spend a little more time on multiple tonguing because I need the extra work there. So yeah, that, that sounds about right. That sounds about right. The, the triple and double tongue, double and triple tongue in the Chop, Chops Master Book is quite challenging and it, I, i'll tell you what if if the master book if you were to reduce the number of, of multiple tongue exercises you do in the master book it wouldn't be nearly as long as as what i'm saying um so like if you only did like the first oh it's silly. If you only did the first four, five, six uh, triple tongue, double tongue, then it wouldn't be nearly as long. Oh, we're over time. <laughs> All right. Um, well, thanks for hanging out, everybody. And... Good questions. We'll see you probably next week. Yeah, Sean says he just did the 20. That's what I thought. Thank you, Gabriel, Karen, James, Sean. Did I miss anybody? And we'll see you next week. God bless you. Have a great weekend.